And he has a book called Words of Power, Mantras by John Blofeld, which I read when I was like nine or ten, and boy, I memorized every mantra in there. Oh, yes, very famous sinologist. He was a very great scholar in China and China arts and a very great devotee of Kuan Yin and Tara. And then when he got into Tibetan Buddhism, that was it. He went crazy with Tara, crazy. He just like Tara, 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 that's all he talked about. Everybody's crazy about Tara. In any case, that's why in the future we have to have a Tara mystical treasures. Isn't that fabulous? Can you imagine a Tara mystical treasures? Yes, I just can't wait. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. Okay, never mind. Uh, now. I'm going to hit on two main reasons on a profound level that we do mantras. And I'm going to hit on a few general meanings that we do mantras. Gen uh, general meanings, no. General purposes that we do mantras that will help us. So you can condense this writing into a short one. You can also make it a long one because there will be information for you. Mantras are very, very holy because... think or well, one day if someone tells us no meat you're going to be vegetarian for one day you're like oh every time you walk by kfc every time you walk by mcdonald's you walk by one of the hawker stands satay stands you're like, i'm vegetarian and just just think of kendo rohi with no beef for one day oh my god you know what she'll do she'll go to the, she'll go to the yoshinoya and beef stands and moon them can you imagine pulling down her pants that don't fit and with her blue underwear on and mooning them? Because she's vegetarian. Yes. In any case, just imagine one day, no lying. No, not even a teeny little lie. You know, one of your ugly, uh, ugly friends that you don't like call you up and they want to go eat, eat, and din, din. You say, no, because my great-grandmother's sister's dog died. I can't. No, no lies. Imagine one day of no sexual misconduct or contact at all. None. No thoughts of it. Not even contact. You think, oh, one day what's a big deal, you know? And for some of us, it's like, I'm already a nun. But uh, not even the thought of it. Not even a thought. Not even attraction to it. Nothing. Nothing. You're, you're just a fruit. Oh. Not le fruit, but a, a fruit. Okay, mademoiselle le fruit. That's different. That was your previous incarnation. <laughs> He's like Madonna. He keeps changing his incarnations. In any case, Imagine one day of not having any negative motivations. Me, me, me. One whole day, none. Of self-cherishing mind. Of putting yourself a priority. One day that from morning to night, you are Mother Teresa. All day, all, nonstop. All you think about is others. You don't think about yourself. And one day of no attachment. No makeup, no hair, no clothes, no, no nothing. Just one whole day. And that whole day is filled with light and love, compassion, clairvoyance, skills, great planning for others, skillful speech, skillful action, and not self-cherishing mind, other-cherishing mind, altruistic mind. Imagine one day of that. And imagine the altruistic side, forget it, just one day of discipline, of cutting out our delusions and illusions, one day of that. And then imagine two days of that. Imagine three days of that. Imagine four days, one week, one year, one month. Imagine a whole lifetime of ethics, morality, compassion. Imagine one lifetime of not lying, of not working for the benefit of oneself, of not thinking about earning, 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 getting, 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 me, 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 me. Just one whole lifetime. Think about that. And then imagine the energy that creates not lying for one whole lifetime. Not lying will, in short, create a type of speech that when you talk, people will listen. When you talk, it has substance. When you talk, it will be properly enunciated. When you talk, people understand. When you talk, it moves people's hearts. When you talk, it changes people's lives. 
when you talk, it changes the brutal mind of a person from that of like an animal into that of a higher being. Animals think for themselves, me, 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 me. It may be, pup, may be cute for a puppy to fight for his food and fight for a bone, but it's not cute for a person to fight other people for their money. So imagine that if you don't lie, if you don't lie, you will be born with a speech that is melodious, pleasant, good words, captivating, very clear. The point is brought across. Not only a good speaker, a good speaker is not enough, but a type of speech that transforms people's minds, transforms people's lives, transforms people's inertia, people's delusions and illusions, and type of speech that motivates them from doing self-cherishing acts that bring them to more sufferings, to acts that bring them to happiness. So ha being a good speaker is not enough. It is a type of speech that has the power of truth and altruism from lifetimes or a life of practices and lifetime after lifetime that when this person speaks, it profoundly moves another person, sometimes to tears. Why? To make them realize what is going on in them and what is really the purpose of life. That type of speech doesn't come from practice. That type of speech doesn't come from a book, doesn't come from learn, learning. That type of speech comes from lifetime of lifetime of lifetime of telling the truth and using the speech to benefit others and using the speech for positive reasons and using the speech not to get money, sex, rock and roll, drugs, fun, and increased attachments, but using the speech to increase people's happiness, increase people's mind, increase peace, increase love, increase the altruism, and using the speech to destroy delusion, using the speech to destroy the very causes that make people themselves and other people unhappy. So that type of speech becomes very, very, very powerful. Why? It is through speech that we can create wars. It is through speech we can create peace. Even people who have excellent motivation, but they speak not well or wrongly, can create wars. Even people who have nasty motivation, but if they're very good in their speech, they can make things move. Imagine a person with good motivation, good intention, and they speak to benefit others. And then they use their speech, their tongue, their teeth, their mouth, their vocal cords. They use their speech in what? In changing people's lives from self-ingratiating activities that bring harm and unhappiness to themselves and the ones they love to benefit for themselves and others and everyone. Imagine a person who uses their speech like that lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So this type of person will eventually have Buddha speech. What is Buddha speech? They have 60 melodious qualities of Brahma, it is said. 60 melodious qualities. Out of the worldly gods, Brahma is said to have the most beautiful and melodious voice. So they have 60 qualities of their voice. 60 qualities. They have the power of speech of a Buddha. Some examples of the power of speech of Buddha, which you can get into more detail in the Lamrim, is when they speak, although they speak one subject, one word, whatever your level of intelligence, it will penetrate your mind and it will hit you. So if you're there in your intelligence, you're there in this intelligence, you're there in this intelligence, when they speak, it will hit you at your level and you will understand at your level. And even when people get together later, they understand it differently, but it affects them deeply and it changes their lives. That's the power of speech of an enlightened being or an advanced being or a Buddha. So when they speak, it isn't just nice words to pick up a pretty girl. It isn't sweet words to just get a good deal on a house or a product for bargaining at Pasamalam. It is the type of speech that, because some people you see, they're very good in talking, but when it comes to changing people's lives, when they talk, they can't do anything. So good speech is not that it sounds nice and you can get things done. Good speech is that it benefits. It changes people's lives because it arises from altruism. So therefore, a Buddha's speech is that when they speak, it hits everybody at their level. One, two, whether you're very far away or you're nearby, 
the level that hits your ear will be exactly the same. That's a Buddha's speech. Just think during Buddha's time, there was no microphones, speakers, sound systems. Thousands of people gathered to listen to Buddha. Thousands, thousands of people gathered to listen to Lord Jesus. Wow, oh, these enlightened activities, they heard, they can hear. And when they speak, it's heard in many languages simultaneously, on many levels. So for beings who don't need speech to hear by clairvoyance, they will hear clairvoyantly immediately. And whatever they speak soothes the mind, calms the mind like water on a fire. They have many, many qualities of the speech. And everything that they speak becomes, this is very important, everything they speak becomes a method, a path, a cause for enlightenment. That is a Buddha speech. That's in short. Now a Buddha mind dwells minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, in skillful means on benefiting others, how to benefit others, direct methods, indirect methods. And when they look at you, when they understand you, they perceive your previous lives down to a pore of your hair, down to your eyebrows, the shape of your eyes, the color of your skin, everything. And it causes for you to have that result. They look at you, they see directly. Your previous lives, unlimited. Your future lives, unlimited. What you are now, even the cause of a single pore on your, on your skin, they know the cause. And not only do they see you in the present, they see the past, the present, and the future simultaneously, all in one shot. And that's just you and every single sentient being on this planet, in the universe, in samsara, they perceive directly exactly what they perceive you. And everything that's going on, everything that's moving, everything that's per perceivable, tokpa, perceivable, they perceive simultaneously. And yet they can talk to you, yet they're aware and they're alert. This is a Buddha mind. And this is based on altruism, compassion, that, that derives from many lifetimes of ethical, moral practices. Amakaya form is the Buddha's mind. Non-tangible, unperceivable, and anyone below that level cannot perceive. It doesn't need a body to be perceived. It can only be perceived by another Buddha, the end. Sambhokakaya form is a Buddha's body in enjoyment form. Enjoyment means not that he runs around enjoying himself. It means a form where it looks like as if it's, he's enjoying himself. Example. When the Buddha manifests as Avalokiteshvara, oh God, it's fabulous. Avalokiteshvara is white, wearing beautiful raiments, R-A-M-N-E-N-T-S, raiments, R-A-I-N-M-E-N-T-S, raiments, beautiful jewels, fabulous hair, you know, clothes that fit, jewelry, ornaments on a fabulous lotus amidst an aureole of light. He doesn't smell. He, his body is perfectly V-shaped. It's soft. It's strong. Yet it's, it's just emitting light. And I mean, isn't that, wouldn't you enjoy yourself if you had that body? Couldn't you see, couldn't you see Jamie with a Tara body in, you know, on Saturday night? That's it. See you later. Forget about your marathon. She'd be on that podium jumping up and down. So imagine if you had such a body like Tara, you know, or Avalokiteshvara, you'd be enjoying yourself, man. Why is it enjoyment body? It's a body that shows you the results of their practice. So that is perceivable by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and high-level practitioners who have visions of these beings. But ordinary schmucks like me cannot see. So for ordinary schmucks like me who can't see the enjoyment body, Sambhokakaya, or perceive the truth body, Dharmakaya, which is without form, we have to stick with the Nyamanakaya. Nyamanakaya, in Tibetan, we call Tulku. T-U-L-K-U, Tulku. Tul means to emanate. Gu means body, emanated body. So a Tulku is a being, high-level being. A real Tulku is a high-level being that is emanated from either the Dhammakaya or the Sambhokaya forms of the Buddhas. And they emanate into bodies that are coarse and rough and that needs the four elements, the five aggregates to function to benefit others. So the mind that, the, that, this, that this being um, is in is, of course, Dharmakaya, 
but the body that they they have is Nirmanakaya. And that body, because it is borrowed of this earth, borrowed of this planet, borrowed of the mineral and resources here. Why is it borrowed here? Because this beings on this planet and they need to relate to the beings of this planet. Maybe on another planet where Mercury is, is the is the uh, you know the um, predominant material, maybe they take a body of Mercury. It doesn't really matter. But on this planet, it's the five aggregates and the four elements. And therefore, therefore, they take on this body like a hotel room to use. It is subject to decay. It is subject to sickness. It is subject to imbalance. It is subject to heat. It is subject to you know deterioration because it is a body that's borrowed. It doesn't reflect the enlightened being. Example, His Holiness the Pension Lama, who is Amitabha himself, gets old, can be poisoned, will die, but it doesn't affect his mind. His incarnation come back again, but his body does get old. Why? The body doesn't belong to an enlightened mind. It is borrowed to be used to spread enlightenment. So, like that, these three bodies arise from the mind of a holy Buddha. Then, the actual body is we don't kill we don't steal. We don't commit sexual misconduct. We don't beat. No vulgarity of the body. And we use our bodies not for making money, not for making fun, not for adorning to increase our delusions and illusions, but we actually use our body in the service of others and to benefit others, whether it's to teach dharma, whether it's to discipline our body for others, whether it's to discipline ourselves or to sacrifice our self-comfort for others. Example, Mother Teresa, who uses her body just for others, just like Mahatma Gandhi, who, went for, who used his body for others nonstop by his fasts that freed so many people and inspired millions around the world. That's a bodhisattva, like Nelson Mandela, like, like the great um, ex-prime minister Mahathir, who had to maintain his body, who had to wear suits, who had to look good, who had to be healthy to run the country and make the country so great. That's using his body. I mean, he could have used his body playing golf all day long, you know, nonstop. But using your body to benefit others, sitting in office wearing nice clothes, that's using our body for others. Sitting here where we could be somewhere else is using our body for others. Why? We're getting knowledge that benefit others. So how happy we are to do that and enthusiastic shows the level of our mind at how altruistic we really are. Why? The more we want to get methods to help others, the more altruistic we are. That's a me measuring stick. So making our, our bodies easily available for others and very happy to do so shows a level of altruism. Why? Everything else you can share, your body you can't. You only have one body. You have to be there. And then suffering disease for others. When you're sick and you're not well and you can still push yourself for others, that's a measures, measuring stick of using your bodies for others. Why? You don't think of your body as yours. You think of something you borrowed, you use for a while, afterwards you dump. I mean, who, who will be ridiculous enough to, to paint up and redecorate, refurnish a hotel room that you rent for overnight? You know, you go in there, you redecorate, furnish, paint it up, and, and see you later tomorrow. Who's ridiculous? Like that, when you think of your body as something you borrow and use, you're not going to be too worried about it and playing with it and doing things with it as an end in itself, but you would use it as a vehicle to reach an end. There's a big difference on how people operate. And then if you use your body and everything else as an end in itself, you will end up in depression, unhappiness. Why? Because it, 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 it tricks you. However you feed it and take care of it, it still gets fat, it still gets sick. However creams you put on it, however, whatever operations you go through, whatever slimming or whatever you do, it still gets fat and it still gets old. And no matter what you tell it to do, it, tell, it does the opposite. And no matter how wonderful oils and whatever you put on your hair, you still lose hair. And I don't care, you can drink moisturizers and your skin will still get wrinkled. It's, it deceives you. It makes you use up everything. And then on top of that, it makes you create pleasure for it. It makes you run around and look for sexual contact. And then all the crap that goes after that, you know, the relationship, the people, the lies, and all that stuff, it's just to please the body. So when we use the body in such a way where we're trying to find pleasure for itself alone, we end up in depression and unhappiness. I'll tell you why. Because it's deceptive. You never achieve it. So when you use your body to benefit others, you hold ethics and morals and you use the body for others 
in the highest form teaching the Dharma and using your body as an example of the Dharma to inspire others to come out of delusions and unhappiness to the medium forms of using, using your body in social works to physically do work or to use your body in practice such as prostrations or to use your body simply to be still and not create more negative actions. Imagine life after life after life of using your body like that. You have a body with 100, it will result in a Buddha body of 112 marks. What is that? 80, 80 minor and 32 major. Some of the marks of a superhuman, of a super Buddha is that, is that it is very tall. The limbs are very long. The fingers are very long. The, 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 the limbs are very soft and very gentle, neither masculine nor feminine. The limbs and the body is very pleasant to the appearance. And it has a golden luster. And the hair turns counterclockwise in curls. It has a ushnisha, it has a ushnisha meaning a pro crown protrusion here. It's not that someone bumped you there, you know, and you got a bump. No. And some people draw the Buddha statues wrong. I, you need to know this. They actually draw the Buddha with hair and wrap it up in a bun. You know, what is he? Auntie Edna? Wrong. He's bald. He's a monk. And the little bit of hair he has is just a little bit of growth because monks cannot have more than two finger span of hair. So he has a little bit of hair which grows in a tuft which looks like little curls. Like African people, they have this beautiful curly hair. When you cut it short, it's like round tufts. But does hair is like that, except when he grows out, he doesn't have an afro, you know, so he doesn't look like Lenny Kravitz. What he has, Lenny Kravitz's hair is fabulous, but Buddha doesn't have that. Buddha had curly, beautiful locks of Indian blue, black hair. Yes. And um, not chicken hair like Paris Buddha. You know, beautiful. And then he has an urn, and so, and this is a protrusion, represent another state. To you, he may look like a UFO, but to another Buddha, it's a sign of beauty. Okay, it's not like he has a cerebral problem, you know, the elephant man, his brain grew that way. No, 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 it's very beautiful. So it's not a bunch of hair tied up. So when you see a Buddha statue with hair tied up, no, no, no. Tanka, no. It is a protrusion of his head. And his beautiful long earlobes, long and beautiful, not because he's from Myanmar and he's wearing those earrings that pull his ear down, you know, like those Myanmar's women. No, that's beautiful too, but that's not the point. And some Buddha statues, they even put earrings on him. No, he doesn't wear any earrings. He's not a drag queen, and he's not a lay person. Okay, monks don't wear earrings. Okay, Buddha's not a drag queen or a monk uh, or a lay person, so he doesn't wear an earring. So when you see Buddha Shakyamuni with earrings, no, no. You ask him to leave the jewelry home, then I put you on the altar. Okay, he has a long, beautiful swan-like neck and golden, strong, broad shoulders like a lion, thick chest, very thick chest, all right, and um, thick body, but not like, you know, Mr. Universe where it's bulging, because bulging with veins is considered not nice. Then he has a beautiful V-shaped body, but it's not V-shaped like that. It's like a Versace cut. It goes down, and then the hips, oh, yeah, it's exactly like a Versace cut. It goes down like that. When it gets to the hips, it's rounded and comes out, almost feminine, and it's soft and very, very beautiful. He has very beautiful legs, you know, some people, some of our friends complain they have short, stocky legs and big top, whatever. Lah. Buddha has long, elegant, beautiful legs, and he walks with a gait. You know, a gait, not a sachet. A gait, not a sachet. You get the picture, birdcage? All right. And um, he has beautiful, long feet that are straight and symmetrical, similar to his fingers with rays of light in between his fingers that actually look like webs, but they're not webs because he's not, you know, a toad man. So actually you can go like that, but it's webs of light from not telling a lie. And he has gold copper colored nails. No, not from L'Oreal. They're natural. They're gold. They're copper colored nails, webbed with light. And on the palms of his hand and his feet have Dharma Chakra wheels imprinted. Not a tattoo from one Utama, all right? Not a Paris Umtari, two Tari. I've got a Buddha mark here. No, they're real Dharma Chakra wheels. They're beautiful on his feet. And when he walks, his feet never, ever touches the ground. Never. But wherever he walks, it leaves a footprint. And um, lustrous golden lights emanate. And when we see his body, although it's so beautiful and fabulous, for some perverts, they'll look at it and say, ooh, yum, yum. But for most people, they'll look at a Buddha body and fold their hands 
and it will calm their delusions down. It will calm their illusions down. And he has this magnificent charisma and magnificent energy that when he shows up at the party, he's the life of the party, literally. And what does that mean? He has a natural body aura that draws people to him, that pulls people to him, that makes people look at him. Why? Transform them into the Dharma. You see, being beautiful and sexy is not enough. Being beautiful and sexy with charisma and a look that brings people's passions down eventually and brings them to enlightenment is the key to beauty. See, some people's beauty bring more delusion and unhappiness to other people. They can't have it, they commit suicide. You know, I can't sleep with her, I want suicide. So it's, 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 not, it's not that. It's not the type of beauty that creates more delusion because what does beauty, male or female, doesn't arise from delusion. It arises from great holding of ethics for many lifetimes. So Buddha holds ethics and morality with his body for many lifetimes, controls his speech where it becomes natural, where it's used to benefit others, and his mind dwells in omniscience. Tamjie Kempa means all-knowing omniscience. Completely. So his body, speech, and mind is in a state of omniscience, compassion, and the full result of elimination of karma. Result of altruism. Just every act he does. Even he picks his nose to benefit some sentient beings. Literally like that. Literally. Literally. All right? And so this type of body, when he practices the practice, he practices for three great aeons. One great aeon consists of 60 minor aeons. One minor aeon, let me just give you a very simple whatever, because they talk in qubits and stuff in the text, and I don't understand what qubits and stuff, so I made up my own little example, which is vast enough. Think of a, a hole in the ground dug one mile long, one mile wide, one mile in breadth. Fill that up with one inch human hairs. I don't know meters and centimeters. One inch human, like, you know, like inch, you transfer, you know, trans whatever. One inch human hairs fills up that hole. Every hundred years, you open it up, take one hair out. So the time it takes to complete, to empty out that hole is one small aeon. Sixty of those is one great aeon. And it took three of those great aeons for Buddha to practice what I just spoke about to become a Buddha. So when you look at a Buddha, as Lama Tsongkhapa prays, your body is a result of the accumulation of three aeons of countless merits. To this great wonder I praise. And therefore, when you look at a Buddha statue, it benefits you because it represents three aeons of body, speech, and mind practice. So if it's a Tara statue, if it's a Vajugini statue, if it's a Shakyamuni statue, a Tsongkhapa statue, a Mahakala statue, a Setrap statue, if it's an Amitabha statue, if it's an Avalokiteshvara statue, Whatever it is, it is three countless aeons of practice. And therefore, whatever you do to that statue, if you put it in a beautiful shrine, if you put gold on it, you put jewels on it, you, you clean it, you make offerings to it, you prostrate to it, you do prayers, you meditate in front of it, you are tapping into three great aeons of ethical virtue and merit of body, speech, and mind. Therefore... When you have that Buddha statue in a room, trust me, your little wrong door, wrong window, wrong color, wrong direction, feng shui, cleared. Because you're talking about, you want to wash a little cup, they give you an ocean worth of water to wash that out. You think your cup will be clean? Trust me, if you swept away, you'll never see it again on the other side of the universe. Can you imagine, imagine using a whole ocean worth of water to wash one little cup? That's what you're doing when, when you put a Buddha statue in a room to clear out feng shui. So you know what? You don't need to change no windows. You don't need to change no colors. You don't need to change your furniture. Just put a Buddha statue there and say, do your job. And then if, you're, if your place has something spiritually off, you know, things that go bump in the night, Things that are attracted to Frajitani flowers and they're there. Things that fly with heads and just intestines hanging. 
you know, things that when you walk down the stairs, you feel someone went, <gasps> or when you're asleep, you feel someone going, oh, in, in Kandarohi's case, it'd be like, more, but most of us would be like, no thanks. So if we put a, a protective Buddha who manifested out of compassion in a fierce form, those spiritual beings become spiritual and leave you alone. All right? So when we offer gold on the Buddha, we're offering gold to three aeons of merit. And you know what happens? You collect the virtues and the imprints to achieve the same thing. And hence, we put ornaments on Buddhas. Hence, Buddha statues are incredible blessings. And therefore, the bigger the statue, the better. The bigger, the better. The more mantras inside, the better. The more jewels, the better. Why? If we adorn ourselves with jewels, it's like putting jewels on a corpse, just put it underground, what's the difference? If we put it on a Buddha, we're putting on what it represents. So raising funds for Buddha statues or paying for Buddha statues or buying or having them is tremendous benefit, tremendous. And that's visual, visual. All right, that's visual. And then when we prostrate to a Buddha statue or we make offerings, what are we making offerings to? Some stone or some, some clay or some, a copper, gold-plated image? No. To a Buddha. And hence, in Buddhist practice, we make Buddha images all over the world, huge and big ones, because what they represent and the benefit they bring. So every time each one of us clowns sees that, whether we recognize that or not, he plants the seeds of enlightenment in our mind because his whole body is the result of virtuous practice of three aeons. You guys understand that? Just think about the impact of that. So, in, And each Buddha is very compassionate because for each of our delusions and illusions and problems and difficulties, he manifests and shows himself in different forms and different colors and different mudras and different stances and different hand implements to counter a specific problem that we have. Specific. So that's why if our particular yidam is someone like Lama Tsongkhapa, oh, the impact is great. To have a big image of him, to have him there, to bless and, and, and clear the environment, to make offerings, to even earn our salary to put towards something holy like that. What are you developing? You're creating the causes for you to become that Buddha image, to be that Buddha body. Incredible. Incredible. And then, that is in physical form. That is in physical form. Now, Buddhas are not stuck or blocked in on just a physical emanation or just one way of emanating to benefit beings because they have an enlightened mind based on altruism and they have skillful means. That skillful mean can manifest in body, sound, sight. So therefore, when the three countless aeons of a virtue of a Buddha manifest in sound, it is called mantras. Mantras are the sound emanation of a Buddha's three aeons of ethical conduct, virtue, practices, asceticism. Can you imagine that? So every time you chant Om Mani Peme Hum, Om Ara Nadi, Om Benza Pani Hum. Om Tari Tu Tari Tori Soha. Ming Mie Tsewe Te Jin Chen Yen Zik. Ri Mie Kien Be Ong Bo Jan Be Yang. Du Fu Ma Yu Jom Zin Sang Wei Da. Han Jin Ke Be Zu Jin Zong Ka Ba. Lo Sang Tra Be Sha Ba So Wang De. Te Ya Ta Ong Be Kang Zi Be Kang Zi Ma Ha Be Kang Zi Be Kang Zi Rang Sa Sang Ma Ka Di Soha. Te Ya Ta Ong Ka Te Ka Te Pa Ra Ka Te Pa Ra Sang Ka Di Bo Di Ye Soha. When you Ong Ma Yak Shat Sa Soha. When you recite that mantra, you are using the power of, of your speech and through that gateway to invoke upon the Buddha's three aeons of countless practice, virtues, and merit to go into you. Now, mantras are words of power. Why are they power? Power for what? Power to transform our delusions. Power to transform our unhappiness. Power to transform our hatred, our impatience. Power to transform 
everything in our mind that makes us unhappy and negative and evil and rotten people and to find the real us, kind, compassionate, altruistic people. So when we recite mantra, it is to counter delusions based on the sound coming from the power of three aeons of practice of the Buddha. Does everybody understand that? That is one way that it helps us. Second way is mantras can be used for developing very powerful concentration and awareness meditation. Everything in life, how much suffering we create for others and ourselves is dependent on awareness. Even in the animal kingdom, now listen up, even in the animal kingdom, how alert an animal is means his survival. So an animal that's duh gets eaten up. No and, if, and buts. No second chance. They get eaten up. Some birds sitting in a tree, duh, they get caught by a bigger bird, eaten. You know, very simple. A stupid snake hanging out, bathing in the sun because he feels a little cold, gets eaten up by a big bird. You know, stupid animals get eaten. Stupid people don't make it. Stupid ghosts don't get any offerings. And stupidity means what? Stupidity is just an evil word that we use because it's fun, but it's actually, it actually means lack of awareness, not being aware, not being aware of what's going on, what's happening around you, in front, nothing. You're always like in your own little planet, and your own little planet is very small. So lack of awareness. So awareness is the key to survival. Awareness is the key to good survival. Awareness is the key to success. Awareness is the key to knowledge. Awareness is the key to happiness. Awareness is the key of Buddhism. Why? When we are aware of things that happen and our level of awareness grows, we are extremely sensitive people. We are extremely alert people. And we are people that can use this alertness and awareness in normal life to succeed in life and in spiritual life to advance and practice. When we're not alert and we're not aware, in ordinary life, we lose. In spiritual life, we can't gain any farther. Why? It all develops from the mind. Awareness and alertness. So therefore, mantras, in the southern tradition of Buddhism, in the southern tradition of Buddhism, they use the breath. They do breath meditations where they sit with a seven-point vital chana posture. Right and left with the thumbs holding. Rested at our lap. The feet, the legs are either in full lotus or half lotus. The back is straight, uplifted. Our spine is straight. Our eyes look forward, not up, not down. Straight forward, if possible, in Zahir's case, on the nose tip. In Jamie's case, in the floor in the, floor in the front, or she'll go buzz eye. But in Zahir's case, he doesn't concentrate on the tip, just the center, because if the tip is a little too far. <laughs> And then the tongue up on the roof of the mouth. And we meditate on the breath. We block out everything. And trust me, it is not easy to meditate on the breath in and out, in and out. How long you can meditate and hold the breath. How long is how your awareness will grow. Because at a certain point in your meditation, you will hear sounds you didn't hear before. You will smell things you didn't smell before. And without your eyes, you can feel the presence of people around you. You can hear the presence around you. And as your meditation advances, your mind calms, your awareness grows, you're able to see ethereal beings. You're able to see higher level beings. You can see uh, spiritual beings. You can even have visions. And then when you go deeper and deeper and deeper, what happens is this. You're able to gain very good memory into things such as very far back into your childhood. You can have perfect memory into things such as when you were even born and what you were thinking inside your mother's stomach. And then when you go back in your memory, you can even remember your previous lives, your previous lives, your previous lives. That type of awareness will grow. Oh, definitely. And then higher forms of awareness meditation will create clairvoyance. You have clear audience, vision. You can see things that people cannot see, hear things that people cannot hear. And you have, you'll know people's thoughts. You have clairvoyance. It all arises from awareness. So if we do the southern tradition, it's a little slower because it's upon the breath. If we do the northern tradition, which the aim is the same, awareness is very faster. So we use mantras. Now, 
when we use mantras, we are doing a double fold benefit to ourselves. We are invoking the three aeons of a Buddha into us, the blessings. One. Two, we instead of focusing on the breath, we focus on the mantra. For example, during meditation, we focus on Avalokiteshvara's mantra. Omani Pemeho, Omani Pemeho, Omani Pemeho, Omani Pemeho. You keep the sound at a still where you can hear it, people outside cannot. You keep it regular, you keep it um, well, and in your heart you visualize a hong around on the moon disk. Around that is Omani Pemeho, circumambulant, going around with six different colors, representing the six different realms of samsara in which you wish to conquer and empty out. And brilliant lights going out into the six realms and eliminating the sufferings of others. Why I recite that mantra very methodically, Omani Pemo. And you focus your mind not on what you're going to eat, you're hungry, you're tired, your legs hurt, you don't focus on the weather, you don't focus on mosquitoes, you don't focus on anything, you focus on the mantra. And how long you can focus on that mantra is how, lo how strong your meditation of awareness is. And when you keep that meditation strong and aware, not only are you able to remember previous lives, your memory becomes excellent, your mind becomes firm and strong, and you're able to endure hardship. Also, simultaneously, because it's invoking on the blessings of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, your meditation will be doubled faster and quicker. Why? Simultaneously, through the breath, you are not meditating on the empty breath that has no substance. You're meditating on Avalokiteshvara, who is enlightened being. Therefore, meditation on that creates merit, which propels your meditation into higher levels. Propels. Why? It is on the basis of merit one gains enlightenment and the purification of negative karma and higher thoughts, higher realization. So when you do the mantras, it propels your mind into a higher state of awareness and it creates great amount of merit. And a third benefit is if it's a mantra, example of Tara, of Setra, of Zambala, whatever the deities represent, whatever the deities represent, you are invoking on but that particular aspect of enlightenment. So if you are invoking on white Tara, healing comes. Strong body, strong mind, strong nervous system, strong bones, strong circulatory, strong um, uh, internal organs, strong muscles, everything strong because white Tara's energy is to heal your body, free it of causes for it to become sick and unhappy so that you can use your body to benefit others. And therefore the result of this mantra on a side is your body will become lustrous, clean, bright, energetic, and extremely attractive to others to bring them to the Dharma. So if you do Zambala's meditation, Zambala's mantra, Om Zambala Zalandraya Soha, you do it in front of Zambala's image with offerings prepared, and you've done the Jorcho, the six preparatory practices of meditation. Jorcho, six meditation, six preparatory practices. You sit in front of Lama Zambala, and you do meditation, Om Zambala Zalandraya Soha, on awareness and invoking his energy, you will destroy the causes for you to have poverty. You would destroy the causes for you not to be successful in business and earning money or whatever you like. You will be very successful in earning wealth. You'll be very successful in gaining wealth to benefit others. And you will also destroy the causes for you to be born in places where it's very poor or no opportunities in future lives. From Lama Zambala's practice. So whatever you mantra you do, A, you tap into three aeons of Buddha's energy and Buddha's merit and ethics. So you gain, the, you gain the imprints to also achieve that. B, you create awareness. You use that as a meditation to create awareness to gain the higher insights within your own mind. C, the mantras also will help you to invoke upon the particular energy of that particular deity that particular representation of enlightenment to gain the particular power or benefit you need from that particular deity. And one more benefit is that because the mantras invoke upon Buddhas, they can be used for healing, they can be used for blessing animals, they can be used for blessing the sick and blessing the dead and helping people to clear the environment. Example, if you do Setra's mantra well and you achieve Setra, achieve means become very close by altruism. Achieve Setra means what? That your mind is very altruistic in propitiating Setra, that your mind is not about me, 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 it's about benefiting others. So when you think about benefiting others and you do Setra's mantra, you have achieved Setra. So when you achieve Setra and you go to a room that's defiled, that's unclean, that's dirty, that's filled with disasters, or many people has been killed, or you go near a person that's 
needs to be exercised or taken or taking trance of something evil or the body is not it's been hexed and you think about altruistic and about benefiting people from that suffering so that they don't do more negative things to create more negative suffering and you recite and you evoke up our setra's energy <sighs> will clear the room why when you blow the mantra it's as if you're blowing millions and millions of setra's into that environment why by the power of your meditation Com join with Setrap's energy, combined with your altruistic mind. Then when you do White Tara's mantra very well and evoke about White Tara, if you work in a hospital, in healing places, as a doctor, as a nurse, oh, it's beautiful. Why? People are very sick on their medicines for your parents, for your animals. <sighs> it really expedites the healing. Very, very, very much. Very, very, very much. And then if you've achieved Zambala, achieved. If you give people Zambala images and they worship and they practice and do it correctly, their wealth will grow. If you do achieve Manjushri, if you have achieved Manjushri, you do Manjushri practices and you do it well, Lama Tsongkhapa Manjushri, you know what happens? When you speak about Dharma, when you speak about the truth, when you speak about things that benefit people, when you speak about change, their minds will turn. Why? You have achieved Manjushri. So you have skillful means in order to bring them to Dharma. So like that, Mantras are words of power on a very basic level to heal and take care of immediate problems, spirits, demons, sickness, unhappiness. And on the next level, on the next level, it creates awareness. It makes your mind focused. Why? You're using the breath in mantra. And mantras can be used to control natural calamities. Mantras can be used to control the weather. Oh, there are many holy lamas I've seen with my own eyes who will blow the Yamataka mantra into the air. Within a few minutes, you'll see rain disperse. In places where there's no rain and they need it really badly, they'll blow Yamataka mantras in the air. Within a half hour, you'll see a downpour like it hasn't downpoured in weeks. I've seen it with my own eyes, not once and not twice. It can't be coincidence. I've seen it. I'm not telling you something I read from 1,500 years ago. I've seen it in my own backyard with high lamas. Trust me, I've been out there blowing till I was blue, nothing happens. But these high lamas, oh, they can control the weather. I've seen it. No ritual, nothing. Definitely. You can heal people's lesions and problems and sickness by mantras. You can clear and exercise them by mantras. But you have to achieve it. Achieve means what? Altruistic thought, concentration on the particular yidam, and devotion to the yidam, and the wish to benefit others. That is most important for mantra practice. And then you have the secret level mantras that without initiation, you cannot do. Why? Because those mantras move the inside. So those mantras are secret. Let me explain why. One of the reasons is because with those mantras, it isn't simply to recite. Those mantras are conjoined with a movement of the wind inside your body and joining the winds into the central channels of your body where from the, the 72,000 psychic channels, it combines into the three main channels. That combines to the central channel where your mind resides. And with those mantra and that meditation, you can control your rebirth. You can control when you die, when you go, how long you stay, and you can control where you go. One of those mantras is about Jubini's mantra. So they are not to be recited by the uninitiate. Why? Why? Because they are combined with the meditation. And that meditation must be given to qualified people who have already finished their preliminary retreats and preliminary practices. And certain mantras that are general, they have meditations, but they're not dangerous, meaning wind meditations. Because you know, you know Chinese have this word, tao feng, wind off. Tibetans also have that. It means the wind literally goes off. We're not talking about women. We're talking about anybody. Because we had a case of a monk, well, that's what he manifested, I can't guarantee, where he went to the mountains, he meditated wrong, came back, he was obnoxiously crazy. Nice guy, but crazy. If there was women running up and down the monastery, he'd chase after them. And no, he, once he caught them, he just wants to hold them, and then he lets them go. He doesn't do anything more, but when you see him, you're like, oh, and he would run around barefoot all over the monastery. I mean, a monk chasing women in a monastery, you know, when women w went through to make offerings and stuff, he chased them. I mean, that's a little not too good. But everybody left him alone because they knew that he was not well. And the, and the story went that he went into the hills for years to meditate, and it went wrong. 
It could have been that, or he's manifesting as Mahasiva. I don't know, but he used to come to my window and scare the crap out of me because my window was facing the road behind me. And then I'd be sitting there, you know, doing, I don't know, picking my nose, listening to Madonna. Yes, in the monastery, I was caught many times, you know, hanging out, you know, reading, a, 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 you know, some serial killer book, whatever, whatever. A everything but Dharma practice I'd be doing. And he'd be in the window and be like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, <gasps> oh, God, he scared the crap out of me. He did this almost daily. So I had this phobia. And you think, well, why don't you keep the window closed? Because it was so hot. There was no air con. I mean, South India, I was burning up. I'd be... Phobia thinking where's Gen Denzin? Gen Denzin means teacher. Denzin is his name. Because he's older, I just can call him Denzin. It's not respectful. I'd be like, and sometimes he'd be sitting there staring at me for minutes. And I turn around, I'd be like, oh, and I just see these two eyes like, <laughs> and I'd be like, oh my God. And then sometimes he'd say, he just split. And then he'd split a few seconds later, I hear some women down the street screaming, ah, it's Gen Denzin. Let's get out of here. Ah. And you hear his footsteps <laughs> chasing them. And sometimes he'd catch them and he'd just hold their hands for a few minutes let them go. Oh, God, that went on for years and years and years. I said, why do you chase women? He says, because they're beautiful. And I'm like, what do you do with them? Well, I like to touch them. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, why didn't I think of that? And he was so funny. And, and, and all the time, he was very dark, very skinny, and he had eyes that flickered. So after a while, I thought, no, he's a Mahasita. He's something something." weird then i'd respect him very much and he comes to my window he'd go like that to me but if there's women of course he split and then um he would always ask me for money or tea or something so whenever i had money i didn't have much whenever i had money i'd take money off and i offered to him with two hands thinking if you're a mahasita may i gain your attainments offered to him all the time i didn't disrespect him or anything the police the indian people um uh, even the indian women no one reported him no one harassed him because he was harmless but his brother who I think his wind is off too, but never mind. His brother, his name is Gen, blah, 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 I can't say it, not respectful, used to tell me that he went to the mountains to meditate, went off. So the higher forms of meditation, you need a guru, you need a guide. So if you have not developed a relationship with your guru from beginning to end, it's very hard just to show up. Example, hundreds of people just show up for initiation and then they're gone. They don't develop a relationship with their guru beforehand. They don't develop a relationship with their guru afterhand. They just show up during initiation and disappear. So when they do practices, nothing happens. No one can guide them. No one can teach them. No one can do anything. We need to develop a relationship with our guru from the beginning to end. And if we have a guru that's skillful, that has love, and that has ways to purify our karma, we follow the guru without complaining. We listen to the guru without complaining. And whatever exercises he gives us to transform our mind, we take it happily without complaining. The minute we're rude, we shout, we say vulgar things, we show bad actions to our guru. It, respect, it reflects us. Why? Our guru in our mind should be a reflection of the highest point of enlightenment, of what we want to achieve. If we're disrespectful to our guru, that's the whole basis. We're disrespectful to ourselves and what we can achieve. So people who are very rude to their guru are very vulgar and very impatient and demand and complain and bitch about their guru. You look at their state of their life. You look at where they are in their life. You look at their body. You look at their speech. You look at their mind. You look at what they do with themselves. Why? If they respect their guru, in this case, because there are many ways to test the person out, it isn't just by Buddhism. In some cases, it's how they respect their parents. In some cases, how they respect their husband and wives, or their lovers, or their friends. There are different meter sticks. But in, in our case, of people who claim that they're, they have gurus and stuff, how they respect their gurus is how they respect their state of enlightenment and what they want to achieve. If they're flippant about it, they're flippant about their, what they want to achieve. If they're rude about it, they're not sincere. But how they act reflects their state of mind. It's very clear. You have to think about that. So gurus are very compassionate. If they are real gurus, they're very kind to people who are mean. They're very kind to people who are rude. They're very kind to people who scream vulgar things and say negative things about them. Why? For them, it doesn't disturb them. They look at them with compassion and think, I need to help this person. Yeah. So gurus will always keep weird, strange, flippant, rude, and nasty people around them. Why? Nobody else will keep them. Nobody else will have them. Nobody else will listen to them. Nobody else will ever help them. So a practice of compassion is not having nice people around you. A practice of compassion is having nasty people around you and to show love and show response to them, no matter what they say and how they complain. Mantras can help us in that. The practice of Om Mani Padme Hum and meditation of Avalokiteshvara and eight verses of transforming our mind can be very great in taking care of other people who need help. So mantras work on very different levels. Secret mantras such as Hiruka, Yamataka, Guya Samaja, Kala Chakra. Those are very sacred. And they can't just be spoken out. Why? Because they're combined with meditation. And, they, and the meditation development of that 
and the recitation of that and the result of that is dependent on holding the vows, the bodhisattva and the tantric vows. So when we hold our bodhisattva vows and tantric vows well, conjoined with meditation, combined with mantra, oh, things move. Things move. So a teacher who is skillful will not put his students in meditation, will not put his students in tantra or initiation, and they will treat them, step them up in the preliminary practices. You know, they'll scold the student. Scold and scold and scold and scold until the scolding doesn't disturb the student anymore. Why? If he, cannot, if he or she cannot take scolding from a guru, he cannot take scolding from the whole planet. So this person will always be fighting and, and violent. So a guru is very kind because he puts himself in the firing line of people who have a lot of negative emotions. Lots of negative emotions. That's the purpose of a guru. The guru puts himself in your firing line. So what happens is this, is that um, when we do mantras correctly, conjoined with meditation, combined with vows, the result is great. Until that point, the guru will skillfully lead you by practice, by meditation, by reading, by study, by training. And if you're lucky to be near a guru for a few years, to be personally trained by a guru, you're very, very fortunate. Why? It takes many lifetimes and many prayers to even see a Buddha image, to have reverence for it and to know its significance, to hear about it. Imagine how much more merit you need to be near a Buddha, a living Buddha or a being who teaches you Buddhism. For you, that's your living Buddha. So to be near a statue takes so much merit, but the statue can't speak to you. To be near a guru who can speak the Dharma to you, that's even better than a statue. To disrespect this person or to talk negatively about this person, to act in an ungracious way to this person, no matter what training you've gotten, reflects your state of mind and your ulterior motive. So then res good results cannot come. So lower states, the guru will guide you until the point of initiation. And when you receive initiation, you practice intensely, the results will be there. Why? Holding the vows combined with meditation and mantra will make your attainments grow and your delusions purified. So mantras are very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. That's why we devote ourselves to a guru. That's why we have respect for a guru. That's why we, we support a guru's work. That's why we help a guru. Why? So that he may do this for us and many others. Why other reason will we do that? Why other reason? So Guru is very skillful in guiding us to the higher meditation practices. If we stick by, if we're compliant, if we're pliant, and we're, we're agreeable, and we let him help us instead of making terms and conditions and times and this way and that way, then you limit his ability to help you. Why? Then you cut it. It's like we love, if we, if we find a new girlfriend, we'll make our time available 24-7 whenever she wants. But if it's somebody we don't like, oh, I'm busy on this day, we're busy on that day, I can't this, I can't that, we have a lot of rules. Similarly, if we treat our, girl, our, our guru like our new lover, we're very compliant, and therefore our attainments will grow, and our knowledge will grow. If we're uncompliant toward our guru, and we make a lot of conditions, then our attainments don't grow. Why? Then you limit the possibility of getting that knowledge. So if you like Buddha statues, better is to have a guru. So the power of mantra is very, very powerful. The power of mantra, the power of mantra, is based on the meditation that you do. This set of meditations that you do from beginning to end helps you to, from taking refuge, developing the altruistic mind, the four immeasurables, the altruistic mind and the four immeasurable types of thought combined with dissolution of the world as you know it and its projections and the reappearance of that world into a Buddha field surrounded by mandalas, and all beings surrounding it to be dakas and dakinis and embodiments of enlightenment. And the meditation stages of dissolving the universe, dissolving samsara into emptiness and arising from emptiness, and then combining that with dissolving the winds, the channels, and drops of your body to purify your delusions and illusions, and then transform your body like that of your meditational deity into that of a, of a vehicle to benefit others up to the point of reciting mantras of felicitation, reciting prayers of benediction and felicitation, and reciting aspirational prayers to benefit others, up to dedication. That refuge to that dedication is what we call a sadhana.
so a sadhana is literally translated as this. Self-growth. Why sadhana in Tibetan, sadhana is Sanskrit. In Tibetan it's called dake. Da means self. Ke means to grow or develop or to transform. So the word can be grow, develop, transform, transmute. Transform, transmute, grow from what? From a delusional state of self-centered mind to a altruistic mind that thinks of others. So the purpose of, excuse me, the purpose of doing a sadhana is to transmute or transform like elixir from mercury to gold, from that of a delusional mind to that of a wisdom mind. That's the purpose of a sadhana. Each deity has a sadhana. Each deity has a mantra. Each deity has a special meditation, and each deity has a special path. Each deity and each mantra and each path is perfect for becoming enlightened, but their approach is different. Each deity sadhana is appropriate for enlightenment and will bring you to enlightenment. But the difference is that the approach is different, and that approach depends on one's own individualistic inclinations. Meaning, if one is more lust-based, desire-based, hatred-based, ignorant-based, anger-based, then according to one's basis and one's immediate heaviest delusion, then one's yidam will be the one that counters the heaviest delusion, simultaneously purifying the other delusions in one go. Example, Lord Yamataka would be anger and deep ignorance and use that method. Lord Hiruka will be lust and attachment. Guya Samaja will be a combination of all three. So Vajugini being the synthesis of Hiruka's practice, a shorter version, will be a counter to desire, lust, attachment, and using that method to become enlightened, and hence her body red and her visage fierce and trampling on demons of selfishness and ignorance and hatred. The black figure under Vajugini represents hatred and ignorance. The red figure under her represents desire. So when she tramples on those three, she tramples on the very causes of samsara, which is the three animals in the center of samsara's wheel, the pig, the rooster, and the snake. So Vajugini is stepping on those three, which is the center of samsara, representing that's the cause of samsara, ignorance, hatred, and desire. So she tramples on those three. When you practice Vajugini together with mantra, with meditation, and holding your vows, it propels you to her state. What's that state? The state free of those three delusions. So a sadhana is something that we do every single day. It's a practice manual from A to Z to becoming enlightened. It's a set form of prayers which starts with refuge, which starts with next is aspirational prayers, the four immeasurables, thoughts, and then dissolution of the environment as we know, and development or the projection of the environment as it should be. Dissolution of the environment as it is, projection or creation of a Buddha environment, a Buddha being and Buddha sound. Everything Buddha. And then using that combined with making offerings supreme and mundane to the deity, such as the offerings we place in front of the Yidam, as a method to collect merit, conjoined with meditations within our mind to control the winds, the drops, and the channels. The winds is the wind, pass is the wind that passes through its chi. The drops is the bindu, or the, is the fundamental drop that started us. The single drop from our mother, red, the single drop from our father, to control that which remains in our body. 
and the channels. One, two, chakras, which are joint energy points for our winds to travel. So doing this sadhana, you are holding your vows that you get through initiation to stop doing further negative things. It's like someone who smokes no more ciggy butts. You cut it off. That's what the vows do. Cold turkey. So a lot of people can't do cold turkey. So before you take tantric vows, that's why your guru doesn't let you go do it. He, does, he trains you up. So people who are fierce, the guru is fierce. The people who are gentle, gentle. Whatever the guru needs to train you up, this way or this way, the guru will train you up so you can take the vows. Because you can't give the vows cold turkey to people. They'll break it. Defeats the purpose. It's like giving a little baby a, sh a, a, a crystal um, glass. When the baby grows up, give it, can, no problem. When the baby is small, you give a crystal glass, break what? Drop. So similarly, the guru trains you up. If you submit yourself to the training, you will come out excellent. If you fight it, then maybe you have a better method. If you fight it, you don't have a better method, you look at yourself. Are you happy? Are you depressed? How's your body? How's your life? Your friends? Your attitude? Your mind? How are you? You have to look at yourself. Okay, then, then by this meditation combined with making offerings, holding your vows and a secret power of mantra when you combine it such in the Vajraginis case your attainments will be very fast very efficacious so a sadhana is a self transformation text self transformation manual and guide to enlightenment and each deity has their specific sadhana to do it can be short or it can be long. The prayers that I have composed that are in DMT, those are not sadhanas, those are prayers. Prayers are aspiration, aspirations in words that we offer to the deities, hoping that what we prayed for will manifest. So aspirational prayers are something we aspire to. So for new people who go into DMT, KMT, they just buy a Zambala and they don't know what to do, I give them aspirational prayers with a mantra so that they can Make prayers of Zambala to have that actualized. And by reciting the mantra, purify their negative karma so that they can achieve something small from it. Questions? Sadhanas and mantras? You can do mantras on their own, of course. Questions? Depending on environment and situation. I mean, if you're with your parents and they think you're a religious fanatic, you join the cult, you don't say they go money, but more 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 home. You don't do that. Okay? And if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're driving, you don't go into shamatha meditation. You know, you don't do that. So, depending on situation, but generally, mantra should be recited at the tone where just yourself can hear it and your, the neighbor cannot, at that tone. And if it's not a convenient, silently. But by hook or crook, your mouth must move. You can't sit there and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you just must not do anything, I'm doing mantras, what? You know, you, can't, you have to at least move your mouth. Very important. Because when you move the mouth to the sound of the mantra, the mantra is the energy, the essence, the attainments, and the power of that deity in sound form. So you're enunciating all the qualities of the deity. And there is a type of mantra. There are levels that you can do the mantra silently, which means yide. Yide is mind mantra, meaning you have reached a stage where you don't have to move your mouth. You can actually recite the mantra in your mind. Um, that's quite a high stage. People can, in Vajrakis mantra, is possible. You have the yide here, and you can move it to your belly, you can move it to your secret organ, you can move it back up. You can move the mantra up and down, recite it without moving your mouth. Oh yes, those type of people, they can control their orgasms. And when they have orgasms, it's very strong, it's very powerful, and they can see their subtle mind with their orgasm. Or in their deep sleep. It's very, very powerful. So Vajigini, you can move your mantras up and down. Without using your mouth, you can use Yide, mind mantra. Isn't that fabulous? So just now when you make offerings that you're gonna, what, what you're praying for is to get all that in the future. 
So I advise you guys to stick around. Because when I get that retreat center open and you guys are my friends, I'm going to be passing you a fabulous, delicious, wonderful Miss World pageant winner, Faji Yogini. Her name is Miss Faji Yogini. Come on out. She won in talent, in beauty, in, 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 in a, a smart and everything. And, you know, when they interviewed you, what would you, what your fondest wish, she didn't say world peace. Oh, yes, that's what you guys are going to get later. Why Vajugini? Look at us. We need her badly. Look at us. Look at Kandarohi. Kandarohi is screaming for Vajugini, screaming. Why is he screaming for Vajugini? Because he screamed at me the other day when I asked him, why don't you get laid? He said, don't you think I've been trying? <laughs> screaming. He screamed back, don't you think I've been trying? <laughs> it's the first time someone shut me up in a long, long time. He's screaming. When he said that, he was screaming at Vajugini. Look at all of you, sexual deviants. Why? Because sexual energy is the most powerful and pervasive in the world. From salmons that, stream, that um, swim upstream, upstream to mate and then spawn and die, to human beings that live their whole life spending money for sex, getting it, the pleasure of it, wanting it. That's why Vajugini is most appropriate for all of us because she, she is the one that absorbs that, allows it, and transforms it. Isn't that wonderful? Absorbs it allows it, and transforms. I didn't say restrict, so you guys don't have to look for the door and transforms it. Because the minute you say restrict, it's like, where's the door? Where's the door? I'm not doing any cult practices. That means no bubbly. Yes. If you say restrict, Paris and a few other of her friends like Kandara would be like, where's the door? Get it? That's why Vajugini is very appropriate. Tonight's talk became a little profound and deep. And I don't know if you can come up with questions immediately, but Saturday, you, I'm sure from now to there, Paris will go home and type out 5,000 questions to harass me with. And what we'll do is we'll have 10 people screen her questions, so it comes out to be one, thank you. Any questions about sadhanas and mantras? Remind me to give you a little short version of mantras and sadhanas on Saturday that you can write up a one little pager on. Because now what I gave you, like, oh, Henry doesn't even write notes anymore. He just, well, after I tell you, he's like, oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Henry just, uh, the only wind that he'd like is some um, um, tobacco wind. <laughs> so think about that. I'll give you a little simpler form of sadhana and mantras, which takes about 10 minutes. But I want to go a little in-depth. i tell you why. You guys are capable of it. And you guys made offerings just now. So I wanted to result in something. Any questions? Yes, it, depend, it depends. In the case of Tara, in the case of Tara, right, her mantra was spoken by Lord Vajapani when he was requested to talk about Tara. In the case of certain other Taras, she herself appeared to people like Nagarjuna, people like Atisha. Example, there was one student of Atisha's that was very, very ill, very, very sick. And um, he had to do 100,000 praises to Tara, 21 praises in order to become healed. He was so sick that he couldn't even recite one. So Atisha felt compassion for him and didn't know what to do, so he prayed to Tara. Tara appeared to him in a simplified form and taught him the 21 verses condensed into one paragraph. And then Atisha passed it to his man to recite it. He became well. So sometimes the deities themselves appear. Okay? In the case of Heru, in the case of Vajugini, Heruka spoke it. In the case of Hiruka, Shakyamuni spoke it. Very good question. All mantras have a source. They cannot be made up. Example, his Eminence. Sam. Rempo. Chi. Apostrophe S. Mantra. Okay, keep the tomatoes and fruits to yourself. Don't throw it at me, all right? Was made up by my holy guru, Ganchen Rimji, who says that if people recite it, it will benefit them. It will transform their minds. It will help them to realize things better and prolong my life. So in the case of Mantra, 
was by His Eminence Ganjuri Ramji, requested by students in West End Hotel when he arrived here. Clients get what they want, sweeping and doing the laundry, the king, the courtesan, bestowed on him Vajugini's initiation, and he became enlightened. So this Mahasiddha has been reincarnating over and over again in India, Nepal, and Tibet. And this Mahasiddha's name is His Eminence Ganjin Tugurumji. This is one of my gurus. He resides in Italy. Yes, fabulous. Lemons here had the great merit to meet His Eminence Ganjin Ramji in Italy. Great merit. Okay, any questions? Any questions, Susan, Sharon? Wasn't it fabulous? Yes. Any questions? Kanda Rohi? What about Sleepy Rohi, Joe? Joe is always in deep shamatha toward the end of the line. What about uh, JJ Rohi? Um, again, a reminder, no more tight shirts for you. All right, go ahead. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, that's a very good question. There are four classes of Tantra. Charya, Kriya, Yoga, and Maha Anuttara Yoga. The three lower classes of Tantra specifically deals with transformation of something, an uh, immediate obstacle. This is what Ken Sirimji says in Chaju or Kriya Tantra. All right? In the lower Tantras, what Ken Sirimji mentioned is you should take care of immediate problems and difficulties. And when immediate problems and difficulties are taken care of, then we're able to practice the higher Tantras which actually bring us enlightenment. So example, if we have monetary problems, we'll receive a Zambala retreat, initiation, practice, profound mantra, oral transmission, and we do his sadhana. And the Zambala sadhanas do not really go in depth into mind transformation. It doesn't really go into in depth into the meditation of winds, drops, and channels. What Zambala's meditation does is actually purify, immediately purifies the causes for us to be in a poverty situation, clears immediate obstacles, opens our heart a little bit more to generosity, and therefore, with that practice, when we get some money, we, we're all right, we can go into retreats, we can do higher practice such as Vajrayogini. Higher and lower is not the deity's power, higher and lower is the method that is presented. Example, the lower tantra such as Manjushi, let's say we have a bad memory, so we go for teachings and we can't stay awake, we're not aware, we're always asleep, we always forget, we're not alert. So we do a Manjushri retreat, the Manjushri retreat gives us the alertness of the mind. Then we can engage in Yamataka. Yamataka and Manjushri exactly the same deity, one is not lower or higher. So that when we engage in Yamataka's retreat, we can gain enlightenment. So the lower tantric, lower tantric methods are specifically to take care of a problem such as poverty, sickness, mind, illness, disorder, obstacles. Example, if we always see spirits, we might need to go into practice of black manjushri in the lower tantras or vajrapani. If we always have horrible skin diseases or horrible sicknesses, we might have to go into practice of vajrapani. Maybe we need to compose and write and do dharma texts. We need to do the practice of saraswati. Manjushri, or the, or the great Lama Tsongkhapa. And then when we're able to do that, along with that, we can do the practices of Yamataka, or Vajrayogini, or Hiruka. Why? The, upper, the, the higher tantras deal with specifically enlightenment. The lower tantras deal with immediate taking care of problems. Very good. So not everybody is able to go into the higher tantras, but people who can do the higher tantras, they don't need to do the lower tantras because the higher tantras embody everything. If you're doing Yamataka, you don't need to do Manjushri. If you're doing Manjushri, you need to do Yamataka. Why? Because Yamataka is the full-fledged form of this practice. This is just a condensed form. Does everybody understand that? Oh, yes. It's very, very powerful.
same as an effect as in purifying outer obstacles, yes, and preparing you for Yamataka's practice, yes, but not for full enlightenment in one lifetime. So when you do Lama Tsongkhapa's practice, what happens is you create the causes that in case you don't become enlightened, you can take rebirth in Ganden heaven. Tushita. One. Two. When you do um, the practice of Lama Tsongkhapa, you purify the three hatred, ignorance, and outer obstacles. Okay? When you do Lama Tsongkhapa's practice, it is the same as doing Yamataka, meaning Yamataka's mantra when you recite, spirits can come near. So when you do Miktama, if you don't have Yamataka, it has the same effect. Therefore, if someone who does Miktamas and their mala is given to you, that mala is put on the door, even very fierce spirits will run. Why? From that mala emits Yamataka deities. Why? They are one in being. So the meaning of that is not a substitute. It means the immediate benefit. All right? If we, if we have cancer and therefore we have fever, all right, or someone else has a flu and they have fever, if we take Panadol, it helps, but it doesn't remove the cause. So like that, either way, either way, Panadol helps. Like that, Miktama helps either way, but Miktama is a short form and the immediate form of a higher tantric practice preparation. So if we do Guru Yoga according to Lama Tsongkhapa, if we do water offerings according to Lama Tsongkhapa, if we do recitations uh, of, of Vajrasattva according to Lama Tsongkhapa, if we do prostrations, if we do mandalas according to Lama Tsongkhapa, focusing on Lama Tsongkhapa, when we do Vajragini, it's as if we don't, it's as if we don't, we're not at the front of the door. We're already in the middle of the house, ready to go upstairs. It's much quicker. Why? Lama Tsongkhapa is an easier di deity to digest for people, as opposed to Vajrayogini, which is qu quite wild and, and too obnoxious and scary. So it has many functions. So it's equivalent to reciting Yamataka Mantra in a sense of protection from outer interferences, yes, and controlling weather and spirits and black magic, yes, but not equivalent in terms of meditation for, for transferring the mind, transforming the mind, sorry. Does everybody understand that? You understand? Yes. Good. Questions? Otherwise, we're finished. I don't have any questions, and don't ask me any questions. Just this kind of look. Don't you love when uh, Juan doesn't go, thank you very much. She goes, means don't ask me anything, please. Any questions? Susan? Beneficial? Yes, good. So you come back for a little while, you just popped in. I saw your hand. Keep it down. I can see your armpit hair sticking out, too. It's like Richard Nixon. Hello. Isn't that rude? That's good. See, when you come back to the peninsula, it's better than that little island over there, oh, whatever you're living at. And remember what the Buddha's telling you. Yes, JT, and let's make it an intelligent one this time. That's what you're doing now. That's what you're doing right now. Every day. You got that right. That's why I said an intelligent question this time. Edit that one out. I don't want anybody to see how evil and negative and how un uncultured and how unpracticed and uncouth this guru is. And I don't want this to be like snipped and sent to the Dalai Lama. I'll be like, uh-oh, called back, excommunicated, kicked out. And then you know what? Next time you go to India, I'll be like running around with a buffalo. But what happened to you? I'm a farmer now. <laughs> Which is what, where, what I was. Isn't that horrible? You guys, on the way to Bodh Gaya, it's like, isn't that Rinpoche? <laughs> God. And then, couldn't you see Kandaro? He should be like, here, Rinpoche, here's some cough drops for you. <laughs> and I'll be like, you little. And then suddenly you see me getting on the lorry, rushing there with my buffalo, and then when Kandaro is running around, getting off the luxury deluxe bus, thank you very much, with the Hindi music blaring. Going to the stupa, I send my buffalo, sick him, sick him, get him. Mm. Oh, God. And it'll be a water buffalo, so it's going to be a big one. Mm, you might enjoy it, though. <laughs> yeah, so, so snip this out so that, you know, I don't end up a buffalo or a rice planter farmer in India. Yeah. Questions? 
Well, no questions. It's been a wonderful, fabulous, beautiful, de delicious experience. And I just can't wait for Saturday because you guys are very sincere. You guys are going to do wonderful Dharma work. And you guys are going to write in such a way that with your skill of composition, you will benefit so many people. So if I can benefit you all with this and the outlet people are here, then it's very pleasurable. Because when we get this out, more and more and more people will be benefited. They'll have some knowledge. And this is what Dame Kong is all about. This is what Kichara House is all about. This is what our outlet's all about. And we're normal people. I make mistakes. I have my diva fits. I have problems and difficulties. But deep down inside, I am a good person. And I really do want to help. So sometimes things go up, things go up, things go down. It's normal. I never said I was a Buddha. I just said I'm trying to be. So that's my catch line. I ain't a Buddha. I'm trying to be. So next time I make a mistake, they'll go, oh, See, you're not a Buddha. I already told you I'm not a Buddha. So keep it smart. Good. Right? You know what? You're Vajrayogini, everybody, again, with your backside. My, my, my. You and JJ and JT should not be allowed to wear tight things. You should wear things that are not tight and that fit. I like that. Things that are not tight and that fit. Oh, that's so evil. And that, the, the origin and the lineage, of, that came from Guru Paris. Well, we have to have a lineage and tell them where it came from, that powerful mantra. Om, wear things that fit. Hong Pei, that came from Guru Paris when we had a vision of her in her green dress. Uh -huh. So Shinzi Paris, you know, Tara appears like that. Vajrayogini appears like that. Buddha appears like that. Paris appears like this. <laughs> Wear things that fit. Hong Pei. And then, of course, the Mahasiddha, um, Tem here, had a vision of the goddess Paris and said, oh my god, it's a fabulous mantra. Um, wear things that fit. Um, wear things that... And I pass it to you, and then you're like, oh, I'm, gonna... <laughs> I'm going to kill that Mahasiddha, and I'm going to slap that Buddha. Oh, God. And then you find out that it's not a Mahasiddha or a Buddha, it's two charlatans. <laughs> Don't you love it? Yes. So, Paris, you've been dethroned before you were canonized by the Bahrainian Inquisition. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you for the preparations. We'll start on Saturday, 3 o'clock, and then we'll finish it off at 7, was it? No, 6. And then we start at 7.30 and finish at midnight. It's going to be a Sleep well Friday night. Take the Xanax. Take the whatever pills you need to sleep well because it's going to be a long, tough, fabulous, fun, whatever. All right? Where there's no Dharma... Let there be the Dharma. Where is Dharma? Let it become stronger. Where there is a misunderstanding of Dharma, may we clear it. May we use our body, our speech and mind to be of tremendous benefit to others, relieve other people of their immediate unhappiness and sufferings and their ultimate unhappiness and suffering and delusion. May we spread the word of the eight verses of thought transformation. May this country and this land be bountiful and peaceful and happy. May the leaders all of this country have long life, health, and happiness. And may their holy wishes and their virtuous wishes all come to fruition. May this place be free of natural disasters and calamities. May it be free of riots and, and wars and poverty. By our presence and the generation of the body mind. May this place, this country, and this area be filled with bounteous thoughts and harvest. Tasso. Get one. Should you jump?
कहरी रे वे चेने से वांटें से क्या जो ये शबे सिद्ध बादे तेंजु जी Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very nice. Very, very nice.